around here. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Adam. I'm one of the elders here, and this is our responsive reading where we, together as a body in Christ, confess the faith that unites us as a body in Christ. It's something we do every week here, using the material of the New City Catechism, which is on the screen behind me there. Uh, this gives us a series of questions and answers that help us to systematically consider what the Bible teaches us. And we find this helpful because it's given us a structure to work through, but we don't hold that material itself to be authoritative. We believe the Bible is God's inspired and infallible word to us. So we let these questions and answers first drive us to the Bible, using this as a briefish teaching time before we then confess these things together. Over the last about month, we've been discussing the Ten Commandments. I always think it's helpful in reflecting on why we've been doing that is to remember we didn't discuss this as a way that we can earn God's salvation. As uh, Galatians 2, 6, or two, sorry, Galatians 2.16 says, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. That's always underlying this, even as we're looking at these things that we are commanded to do. But we, re we review the Ten Commandments as part of how we as God's people can glorify God by loving him, by trusting him, obeying his will, his commands, and his law. So in that context, we're asking this week, can anyone keep the law of God perfectly? And of course, we're saying, what does the Bible say about this? And a quick summary of scripture, it doesn't look very good for us, right? Genesis 6, 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. But you know, well, that's before the flood. What about after the flood? Well, how about Psalm 14, verses 2 and 3, where David says, The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have been corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Also, Jeremiah 17, 9, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Well, you know, well maybe that's the Old Testament. What does the New Testament say? Does it have anything better for us? Well, how about, uh, well, aside from some of that being quoted in the New Testament, oh, there's also 1 John 1, 8 through 10, which says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he, speaking of God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Again, not a very good prognosis for us. And the last passage I want to consider, uh, which ties in also with the Ten Commandments, specifically is from Mark 10, verses 17 through 22, which says, uh, as Jesus was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, well, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And you know the commandments. Don't, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Sell all that you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Right? Jesus starts by declaring, no one is good except God alone. And that's tying into this theme we've been seeing through scripture. But what does he state as evidence for this? Well, a number of the Ten Commandments, right? That we are, those show us that we are not able to keep God's law perfectly. If we consider any of those, they should show us that we do not keep it perfectly. Yet foolishly, this man thought, oh yeah, I've kept these. I have kept these fully. But Jesus' challenge to him revealed what the man truly loved. Not Jesus, but his wealth. Right? That was more important to him than Jesus. It was an idol. And he was guilty of idolatry. And that's what this reveals. So having looked at all these passages, it's pretty clear the Bible emphatically teaches us no one can keep the law of God perfectly. But it's not enough for me to stand up here and just give you law. We also need some gospel, right? Because if Jesus taught us that no one can keep the law of God perfectly, and no one comes to the Father except through him, then we can't rely on works of the law to save us. Which is why Paul wrote in Galatians 3, verses 10 through 11, all who rely on the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law, and do them. 
now it is evident that on, uh, sorry now it is evident on one or that whew, try this again now it is evident that one is justified before God whew, well, let's try this again it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law for the righteous shall live by faith I had a typo there that's messing me up that's why um, but yes no one shall no one is justified before God by the law the righteous shall live by faith. Jesus didn't come to abolish the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them, as he said in Matthew 5, 17. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh, yet he himself was without sin. He kept the law of God perfectly. And he, as an innocent, spotless lamb, bore God's wrath against our sin in his death on the cross. And that's why Paul wrote in Romans 8, verses 3 and 4, that God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So we're not saved by works of the law, but by faith, resting on the works that Jesus Christ has done in his life, his death, and his resurrection, which are sufficient to redeem us from our sin. So at this point, I invite you to stand and join me in confessing the words of the New City Catechism. I will read the question at the top and invite you to join me in reading the words beneath, or the answer beneath. So, can anyone keep the law of God perfectly? Since the fall, no mere human has been able to keep the law of God perfectly, but consistently breaks it in thought, word, and deed. Let me just take a moment here to pray. Heavenly Father, as we have considered your word this morning, we cannot escape from the fact that your word in ways, well, Lord, your word condemns us, for it shows us our sinfulness. It shows us ways in which we are evil, in which we fall short of the glorious goodness that is revealed in your character. Lord, we, just like all other people, we fall short, we sin and fall short of the glory of God. But we thank you, Lord, that you have not left us to wallow in our sin with no hope, but rather you sent your son in the likeness of sinful flesh, yet without sin, that he was the perfect spotless lamb and that he has suffered your wrath against our sin. And when we place our faith and our trust in that is sufficient for our forgiveness, that you forgive us our sins. And not only are we forgiven, Lord, we are clothed in his righteousness. We become good and acceptable in your sight. So, Lord, we thank you both for the law, which reveals to us our true state, but also for the gospel, for the good news of Jesus having conquered sin. Lord, help us to rest our hope in that this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.